Welcome to the Music and Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emily williams Birch, and this podcast, it exists for you. Whether you're a music lover, an educator, a choir member, each week we bring guests to the show to help explore what matters in music. I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome to the show. Hello, and welcome to the Music and Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emily williams Birch, and today we're talking with Dr. Edie Cope. Dr. Copley is a retired director of choral activities from Northern Arizona University, but she's so much more than that. In this conversation, she tells us the incredible story and the amazing journey that she went on throughout her career. You're about to hear some really awesome stories that I know are going to inspire you as educators and as music lovers. Then we talk about the importance of vulnerability, and Dr. Copley gives us lots of examples and really incredible ways that we can use vulnerability to build relationships and to support our students. And in the end, we talk about service and giving back and ways in which you can do that and why. This conversation was one of those archival moments where I'm just so glad that we were able to capture Dr. Copley's story because she has done so much for our choral community and I'm really excited for her tenure as president-elect, president, and past president of the American Choral Directors Association. Anyway, you'll get to know all about her and all of that in this episode, which is brought to you by our friends at Kaleidoscope Adventures and the Kinnison Coral Company. Now, if you're enjoying this conversation or you want to hear other conversations, jump over to patreon.com slash musicedmatters and join the community. We meet up together once a month, but we also have brainstorming sessions for people that you want to hear on the podcast. Remember, this podcast exists for you. I want to know who you want to hear and what you want us to talk about because it's just so much fun to have this space for these types of conversations. So I hope that you enjoy this one. Stories and Service with Dr. Edie Copley. Today on the Music Ed Matters podcast, we are talking to Dr. Edie Copley. Hello, Dr. Copley. Hello. Nice to see you, Emily. I'm so excited that we get to have this conversation. Thanks for tuning in and making time for this. Well, thank you for inviting me. I look forward to it. I'm really excited to hear your story. You are part of our Women's History Month series, and I think your story is super inspiring. Will you tell the listeners, who are you and how did you do this whole choir thing? Well, it's a pretty complicated story in a way, because I, um, in contrast to a lot of colleagues that I've met, you know, they, they're they talking about in being involved in like a children's choir, church children's choir growing up and sang and everything. And I'm just of that age where um, I went to a one-room country school, um, yeah, and uh, but not not as bad as some of my friends because some of my friends. I was talking to someone the other day, and they went, um, uh, "Well, I went to a one-room country school, and there was like grades one through eight, you know, and there were seventeen kids, and it's eight grades." And I said, "Oh, well, it wasn't like that for me. I had one grade of about fifteen kids." you know, in a one room country school. Well, the the teacher, you know, if they had music, uh, like kind of a musical background, then a lot of times, believe it or not, a couple of them, my fourth and sixth grade teachers um, were square dancers. So every Friday we'd move the chairs out of the, off the wooden floor in the one room country school and everyone would learn how to square dance. And, and how to call a square dance. And so, I mean, that's kind of where my music started in elementary school. Now we did have a music teacher, but they only came like once a week, you know, like they pull up in a station wagon and they'd have like a box of like, you know, like, like shakers and tambourines and stuff. And, and we had some like silver Burdett books and we, you know, turn and sing like American. Well, this is kind of cool. We'd start, we'd sing American folk songs and patriotic songs. We all learned those songs in elementary school. Mm -hmm. I don't think they, you know, they learn as many of those as we did when I was growing up, but that was music. That was it. So I think the turning point for me was when my mother came to me when I was in about eight years old and she said, would you like to play the piano? And I went, I don't know, I guess, you know, cause I grew up on a farm. I mean, I was at the end of a dead end road on a farm where, you know, on that mile of, of, of gravel road, there was a co- older couple with no children and another family that had like four or five kids. And, and us, the, my, my two brothers, you know, that was it. I mean, we're kind of out in the middle of nowhere. And so um, it just was kind of 
a different situation growing up on the farm. And so my mom said, would you like to play piano? I was like, oh, I guess, I don't know. She said, I always wanted to play piano. And my mother was gonna buy my, you know, her mother was gonna buy her a piano. My mother immigrated from, from Germany. And so when my mm -hmm. mom was like, I don't remember about 12, her mom was gonna get her a piano. And then her mother died suddenly of an appendectomy. And so she never got the piano. So she said, you know, if you want to play piano, I will make it happen because it never happened for her. And so we got the piano. My parents got me a fantastic piano teacher that lived in the town uh, south of where the farm was in Davenport, Iowa, which is eastern Iowa, like the Quad Cities. You know, it's a pretty big metropolis that's about seven or eight miles south of where our farm was. And she got a fantastic, fant I mean, like, she researched. She got like the best mm -hmm. piano teacher in town. And so I studied with Mrs. Black for fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, playing all kinds of classical music. But that's where I, you know, I learned how to read music. And so yeah. then I would be in elementary school in fifth grade, sixth grade, and they would say, let's do this. And I would go, oh, let's read this part. And I'd start reading the alto part and doing all these harmony parts. And the music teacher was like, what are you doing? <laughs> I said, well, this is, this is more interesting, you know, <laughs> you know, just... <laughs> So anyway, this is before differentiated instruction. So um, anyway, I had a great piano, a piano teacher, but I was doing all classical music. Ick, ick. I didn't mm. want to play all classic. I want to play something fun. So I went to my mother and I said, I want to quit piano. I don't want to play. Besides, I'm playing in band by then. I was playing clarinet in the band in seventh grade. I started band in seventh grade. So we, I quit Mrs. Black and signed up for another piano teacher that would let me play popular music, you know, like musical theater and stuff. And mm. I didn't like that either. So why not? I just didn't like the teacher. The first teacher I had was pretty, you know, technique oh, yeah. and scales and, you know, like, you know, that kind of thing. So anyway, um, fast forward, I, I, I just went, I'm going to play in band. And I sang in choir, you know, in junior high choir. And I accompanied the choir and alto section leader. And, you know, I was like kind of a leader in choir. And then I went to high school and we got a new high school. It was a junior senior high school now. We've moved out of the country school into a junior senior high school combined. And moving up. Moving up. Of course, the choir practiced in the cafeteria and we sang in the gym. <laughs> but hey, yes. you know, yeah. The band had a band room, but not the choir. Okay, so um, I started singing a choir in high school, and uh, but I auditioned for this new teacher my freshman year, and everybody goes, oh, Edie, you're going to get in. I mean, you can read, you're a accompanist, you know, it's going to be freshman choir, you're going to make it. Well, I was scared to death to audition for this new teacher, and I, I tell my students this, especially kids that auditioned at the university that were like, so scared, and I go, hey, you know, I know exactly what you're going through. I, I was scared to death with this new teacher, you know. So I went in saying, I don't know, my country tis of thee. I must not have done very well because I didn't make the freshman choir. No. They put me in the girls' choir, you know, like the all the girls that didn't make it went into that other choir. You know, that typical, like, unfortunately, yeah. years ago. And so yeah. I went home and told my parents, I'm dropping out of choral music. I mean, obviously I'm not very good at it. Uh, so I'm going to stay in band. I'll play in band. So that's what I'm going to do. And my dad went, but I thought you liked to sing. I said, well, I do, but you know, and he goes, well, who's, who does the women's choir? Is it this new teacher? And I said, no, it's Mrs. Oles. And Mrs. Oles was one of my elementary teachers. And, and, and he goes, well, you know her. And you know, why don't you go sing for her? And I said, well, they put me as a second soprano. And obviously I'm an alto. <laughs> So I start, <laughs> so good. I go to the women's, the, the girls chorus rehearsal. And the first thing Mrs. Ole says is, are there any second sopranos that will move to alto? And I went over. So <laughs> sang in that choir all year until the spring. And then there was an, a, you know, the activity bus that take me home after, cause I had a clarinet thing after school for contest. I was sitting out waiting for the activity bus and the choir teacher, the new one that didn't put me in the freshman choir, came out of her mm -hmm. room and, said, and one of the kids said, "Hey, there's Edie. Edie sings. She could come in and sing in our in our quartet. Have her come in and sing." So the teachers all sitting there. Well, who are you? And I said, "I'm a freshman. You know, I sing in the women's chorus." She goes, "Well, do you want to 
sing with us. And I said, okay. And they were doing Bally High from South Pacific. Mm. And I had played it on the piano, so I knew it. And so, and it has that big alto solo at the beginning. I just went, started singing. She goes, you should be in the high school concert choir. You should be in the freshman choir. You should be in the concert choir. You should be singing solos at contests. You should be doing everything. My whole life changed that moment because all of a sudden I was going to contest. I was taking private voice lessons. I was singing in, you know, moved up to the top choir in the school, like adjusting schedules. And then I auditioned for Allstate my sophomore year and my fall of my sophomore year and made only person in the choir that made Allstate. 28 people auditioned. I was the only one that made it as a sophomore. People were really mad. I was really happy, but I couldn't show it. Couldn't show it on the bus. And then this is the changing thing. You Now you got all the stuff leading up to it, piano and all that. And then I got the Iowa Allstate Choir and I sang in this 600 voice Allstate Choir in Des Moines, Iowa mm. and heard 300 tenors and basses behind me. And I thought, I you know, I goosebumps for like, I don't know, 10 seconds. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool to do this for a living? You know, mm. so then I started doing all this stuff in high school, everything choral, you know, doing sectional rehearsals, you know, doing all kinds of things. And then my high school choir director said, why don't you go to Luther College? You should you should apply to Luther College where Weston Noble is because it's a really good program at Luther College. And so I told my parents I wanted to go there and they said, we can't afford it because it was a private school, but they did everything they could you know, and you fill out all the FAFSA forms and all that. So I was able to go to Luther and I majored in biochemistry and music because I loved math and I loved science. I loved biochemistry. So I thought, well, maybe I'll be a genetic researcher. You know, I thought that'd be kind of cool. And then I had all kinds of conflicts at Luther with labs and things because of the choir rehearsals. And so I went, mm -hmm. I'm just going to do music education. So that was life changing, that all state experience and then being at Luther. And um, then I got my first job. Am I going on too long? No, I love this okay. story. This is great. Like, I have one really quick yeah. question that is not related. Do you remember any of your square dances? Oh, yeah. I, I, could, I think I could. I think I could square dance if, if I went to a square when dance. When I now. see you at the next conference, I'm going to, we're going to find a way to square dance in the hallway. Mm. That would be fun. Um, and then second question, when your elementary teacher was teaching your girls choir, how did she handle losing you to the concert choir? Was she unhappy to lose you or was she excited? Well, this was ninth grade, you know, ninth grade. It was like she, she, you know, they made that adjustment so that I could be in a different choir and, and she was okay with it. You know, I mean, the really cool thing is I ran into Mrs. Oles at my, at my mom's assisted living like about, you know, like my mom passed away in 2014. And I think I ran into Mrs. Oles in 2000, like 12 or 13 at my mom's assisted living. She was playing the piano for the residents. And I, and my Whoa. mom goes, well, that's Mrs. Yeah, there's Mrs. Oles. Do you remember Mrs. Oles? And I went, what? And I went over and we had this great conversation. You know, she's, she has oh. since passed away, but I was just so glad to connect with her you know, down the road. That was cool. what a beautiful that story. Was cool. Okay. You're giving us so much inspiration for the people listening for whether you're an elementary school right. teacher or a middle school teacher or a high school teacher, these moments really do matter. Do. And you get to college, those moments mattered. You chose music education. Tell us about this first job. Well, oh, I did. I should go tell you one other thing. Sure. Junior year in high school, I crawled mm -hmm. back to my piano teacher. The first one, Mrs. Black. Mrs. Black. What did she say? I went back. I, I went back and I went, I think it should, I, I, I'd like to take more piano. And she looked at me and she goes, why are you doing this? And I said, well, I might, I might be a music major in college. And so I know that more piano would be really good for me. I, I've continued to play, but she, she looked right at me and she goes, well, I'm not going to be able to do much with your technique at this point, because, you know, I'd stepped away seventh, eighth, ninth. 10th mm -hmm. grade, four years I was gone. And I think those are the formative years of building the technique. You know, and mm -hmm. she was so selective with her studio. She only had about 20 students, you know, and she said, your technique, no. And I just looked at her and went, oh, she said, but 
you will need to know how to sight read and you're going to need to know music theory. So that's what we'll work on. So I was doing like secondary dominant, you know, analysis in high school. Like what's happening here? Oh, that's a second theme group. What key is it in? Da, da, da. How did we get there? And I would do all of this University of Michigan theory book, you know? So when I got to Luther, it was like, Ooh, you know, oh, theory yeah. was really, but you know what? I became a theory tutor at Luther and I helped mm -hmm. kids with tutoring. And so, and sight reading, oh my goodness, to get my hands on something, not play it perfectly, but be able to get my hands on almost everything the first time. That was so helpful for my career. I mean, just so helpful. Mm -hmm. oh, I loved Mrs. Black. She was great. Okay, first year teaching. Small, small country, kind of like uh, rural schools, three miles south of the Des Moines airport. Oh. Yeah, and I had six through 12. I taught eight classes a day. Um, oh sixth God. grade general music, seventh grade general music, seventh grade choir, eighth grade choir, high school choir, chamber choir before school. And uh, I had 500 students. And we didn't, you know, oh. you had to do all the report cards by hand. Just think about that. Oh. <laughs> think about oh, my that. hands hurt. Yeah. I take a day off to do the report cards, you know. Whoa. And so, but, and they had no choral program, nothing, you know, that we had, I had, I had 22 in the high school choir my first year, one boy and 21 girls. And we, um, I told all the girls they had to find a boy or they could, you know, and they, do you want a girl's choir or a mixed choir? And they went mixed. I said, we well, have to find a boy. So they all went out and looked, but I, they said, well, what happens if we can't find one? I said, you're out. And they were like, what? You know, so I had cheerleaders going, don't worry, honey, I'll get two. I'll get two boys. Don't worry. <laughs> and sure enough, I, you know, second week of school, I had like 40 in the choir, you know, with all these guys. And the, the, the thing I, I can't believe I did this, but I just said, Hey, look, you know, stay for one week. If you don't like it, you can quit, but at least we'll start with something. And I think one or two boys quit. Most of them stayed. And then I was there for three years. And then I went to grad school at Carnegie Mellon university, mm -hmm. right out of Luther. I went to the Blossom music festival and sang there that summer for eight weeks in the Blossom festival chamber choir. It was a 20 voice oh. chamber choir, national auditions, five altos, five tenors, you know, that kind of thing. And it was great. Van, I worked with Vance George, Robert Page, Alfred Mon, and we did a concert mm. every week. It was, I just, this contrast of professional choir versus nurturing mm -hmm. liberal arts, you know, right. memorize all the music and hold hands and go on tour. And this was like, Solfege, here we go, Debussy, you know. <laughs> it was just Whoa, it was so hard. It was so hard. I just lived in the practice room, but it was so good for me. And then that was right out of college. And then I went and student taught. I'm not student taught, but um, um, my first year teaching. That was hard. That adjustment from a professional choir into first year teaching. Mm -hmm. Great experience, though. I mean, it goes back to what we were talking about a second ago, prior to this the start of of your podcast, and that's that. You know having gone out and actually done this, gone and gone out mm -hmm. and be in a school where there's nothing, you know, no choral program and to have to build a program and figure out how to do it. My first, first day of class, you know, they came up to me and said, so what are you doing for the musical? And I said, I don't know. I mean, I just got here. I mean, I literally got there three days before school started. And I said, I'm not sure. And I said, when is it like March or, and they said, October. <laughs> And I said, wait a minute, you don't have an auditorium. They said, yeah, we do it on the gym floor. And I said, you do a musical on the gym floor? And they said, yeah, we put a tarp down. And then we put up some, some uh, four by eight platforms. And I said, well, what do you do for scene changes? And they said, well, we have the main scene over here. And then we have the other scene over there. And I said, yeah, but what do you do for lighting? They said, we got a spotlight. And so they have one of those little portable spotlights. You just <laughs> see, see what, right, right, right. <laughs> So we did a musical, um, <laughs> but anyway, it was a real learning experience. And I had to teach general music. I not had to chose to, but I mean, I didn't, I didn't have a record player. I went up and I said, what, what do you, we need a stereo. I need to be able to play recordings for the kids and that kind of thing. And they said, Oh, okay. And it was a terrible piano. I got a new piano. My budget was a hundred dollars for four choirs for the year Whoa. for all their music. Why can't we just Xerox it? You can mimeograph it. You can mimeograph it. Mimeograph. Yeah, yeah. 
Those things smell bad. Oh, they smell great. <laughs> so, but anyway, we just, yeah. And then Robert Page had convinced me, he'd been bugging me, come to Temple. But then he went to Carnegie Mellon to start a new program, a conducting performance program. So after three years, I went to grad school and conducting performance at Carnegie Mellon. In between there, I spent summer school at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And I took a whole summer mm. school with Lynn Witten and Walter Collins. And that was a great summer. I stayed there all summer and took classes with them. And I almost went there for a graduate program, but this conducting performance degree at Carnegie Mellon was a lot of pull because it was working with you know, the Wind Symphony and the Baroque Ensemble and the Philharmonic Orchestra and choir and opera pit conducting. It was like all professional conducting focus with Paige there. Yes. So I really thought, no, this is, this is really unusual, an MFA program in conducting. So I went there, I did that uh, for a year, was great, loved living in Pittsburgh. And then I got a call from the music coordinator back in Iowa in, at Waterloo Cedar Falls, which is near the um, uh, University of Northern Iowa, it, you know, college town. And she said, yeah, I'd like you to apply for this central high school job in Waterloo. And I was like, what? I, I, I'm in grad school. And she said, yeah, but I got your name and I heard your choir sing last year at a festival, your high school choir, and I want you to apply. And I was like, I'm in the middle of my grad program. I said, but I thought, well, it wouldn't hurt to apply. you know." So I went back to Iowa and I applied and it was a beautiful school new i mean you know they had a planetarium they had a they had a in the high yeah, school they had an olympic swimming pool i mean it was just in the, in high, the school. high school i mean it's just a gorgeous school and they wanted me to be the department chair i was 25 years old oh yeah. and so i went hmm okay so i ended up taking the job i went to robert page and said i'm going to take a job in iowa teaching you know high school he was furious and, uh, um, but I said, no, I really think I should do this. It, I, I wanted to teach at a small school. Then I wanted to teach at a big high school. And then I wanted to actually um, uh, teach college, you know, like go to grad school and then eventually teach choral music education to teach kids how to teach. That's what I really wanted mm -hmm. to do for my career. And I said, that's kind of the path. And he said, you should be doing opera pit conducting and you know, doing, this is what you should be doing. And it was so tempting to stay, but nope, I went back to Iowa, I took the job, I was there for four years. And, you know, talking to high school directors out there, you know, boy, I feel your pain when it is that you have the spring hits and it's time to do that festival at this local college, it's time to do auditions for regional choirs, it's time to do small group ensemble, then it's all state. And then there's that other festival you wanna take the kids to. And you know, it's like every weekend, it seems like there's something going on. And I was doing that. And I also had a show choir. So, yes. so I did show choir there. And, um, and so we were doing competitions, show choir competitions on top of all the stuff I just mentioned. And after about four years, um, I was fortunate. I was the assistant conductor of the community choir there with uh, the university conductor. So I was doing like B minor mass and really working on some really nice stuff with them. But after about four years, I was just like, man, I don't know. And I've, I had hit a wall and I was like, I think I'm burned out. I think I need to go do something else. It's just mm -hmm. too hard. So, you know, there's, when I meet people that talk about burnout, boy, I know what they're talking about. I really do. But what happened was the orchestra director at the other high school in town, she and her husband were good friends and she was a St. Olaf grad. And she said to me, Edie, well, if, if you're looking for a change, why don't you go teach overseas? You know, you're not married. Why don't you just go teach overseas? And I just looked at her and I went, what? She goes, yeah, I did my student teaching, you know, in India. And I went, what? Oh. And she said, yeah, I was in Delhi doing my student teaching in, in India. So why don't you go teach overseas? You might really like that. And I was like, oh, okay. So it was kind of back in my mind. So I was home reading the paper one night, opened it up and they said, International School Recruiting Fair at Northern Iowa at the university in my town. Whoa. And so, you know, here, send a check for $25. It's now 300, I think, but 25 bucks 
to go and then we'll send you a list of the schools that are going to be there, the schools that aren't going to be there and, and what's open and everything. So I went, okay, send them check. Thing comes back. There's a little booklet. Here's all the schools that are going to be there. I open it up. The first one is the American International School in Vienna, Austria. And I went, okay, yes. let's see if they have an opening. Secondary choral music. Well, going to apply for that one. And then I also applied for the International School in Nairobi, Kenya, and in Taipei, Taiwan. So I went and interviewed with those headmasters. And it was during ACDA, the regional ACDA was happening in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And I'll never forget this because my interviews were on Saturday, but I was down at the regional and I had dinner with Weston Noble on Friday night. We're sitting at a round table, having dinner with friends, sitting next to him. And I said, well, I'm gonna have to drive back up to Waterloo tonight after the concert because I have these interviews tomorrow for an international school. And Weston Noble looked right at me and went, oh, Edie, oh, Edie, yeah. And I said, well, and he goes, where, where are you, where are you interviewing? I said, well, Taipei, Taiwan, oh, Nairobi, Kenya, oh. the American school in Vienna, Austria. Oh, <laughs> that, that might be pretty good. And I said, that's what I thought. So I drove up there, did the interviews, waited. That was February. And I didn't hear anything. February, March goes by. I didn't hear anything from anybody. And then all of a sudden I got a job, you know, like, hey, come to Nairobi. I was like, oh, come to Taipei. But I didn't hear from Vienna. So I, I ended up calling long distance to the school and wow. said, so what do you think? And they said, um, well, we're working on it. And I said, well, I, I got these other schools on hold. I want to, you know, and they said, and so then they called me back about three days later. And I was like, yes, no, yes, no. Should I do it? Should I do it? And I said, yes. So I went to the American International School in Vienna, Austria, and I taught there for four years um, in Vienna. Wow. And, um, and then after it was great. And I taught, and I taught sixth grade general music, seventh grade general music, eighth grade fine arts, high school choir, uh, you know, seventh and eighth grade um, chorus. Um, I did a musical and everything, but you know, there wasn't all the other stuff. There was only like one big festival in London a year. And, mm -hmm. and then after school was out, you would just get on there, the tour bus, and it would take you back to your, 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 where you near where you live. And then you'd go to the opera that night, or you'd go sit at a cafe and, you know, and grade some papers and sit outside and have a coffee. You know, it's just was, and it's such a gorgeous city. Um, uh, skiing on the weekends and lots of vacations and lots of travel. And then after my fourth beginning of my fourth year, I looked in the mirror and I went, Edie, if you don't go back to grad school and finish grad school, you will not go back. The job is mm. too good. The pay is too good. The mm. place is too good. The students were too good. I mean, it's every, all the kids from the UN, mom and dad were ambassadors, the American Russian think tank, um, you know, just all of these, you know, wonderful, talented, bright kids. Um, so, so I took my GRE, I applied to school during ski week, I flew back to the United States and did all my auditions. And I ended up doing my graduate work at the University of Cincinnati, uh, the College Conservatory Yay. of Music. And uh, I had lost all my credits for the master's degree because I had to decide, do I go back to Carnegie Mellon to finish or do I take this, the job in Europe? And if I took the job, I would lose all my credits. So I went to Cincinnati and they said, well, we'll fast track you. So I did, oh, I took 21 credit hours a quarter and I did the master's in one year and then I did the doctorate in two. And then, oh, wow. and then I stayed one more year to work on my dissertation. And, and also they had me teaching. I, I did the women's women's chorus and I taught undergraduate conducting. And uh, I also was the assistant director of the May Festival in Cincinnati. So I did that yeah, for, that's, a big, that's deal. a big deal. So preparing stuff for Robert Shaw and you know all kinds of great people coming in for the May Festival. So that was a great experience. I also had a church job there the whole time I was in Cincinnati. And um, well, I've had church jobs kind of all the, all the, along the way, except in Flagstaff. I did not do church church music and flag. 
because I did the community choir. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, I, uh, yeah, I went to Cincinnati and then I started applying for, for jobs and I was lucky. I had, I had three job offers for, to teach at a college. And I took the one at NAU, Northern Arizona, because it was such a choral climate, had such a great choral tradition. The first concert choir, university college concert choir in the state of Arizona was the NAU choir, concert choir in 1933. Mm -hmm. And so it had a great oh. tradition. Um, it had, a, I don't know, just a choral climate that I really liked. And um, I don't regret it. So I was there for 31 years and, uh, and I just retired in June. Uh, of last year. So that is my whole life. Wow. I love this story. This is such a, I'm so glad we captured it. Okay. A, yeah. your teachers and their decisions to offer choir to, like, to encourage you to be a part of the, the audition high school choir there. Just, Hey, you want to come sing alto your piano teachers for knowing what you were going to My need. mother. You, your mom. Oh my goodness. I always wanted to play. Would you like to try? Like the people and the decisions that ultimately directed you down the path that you were meant to go down. Oh, yeah. But also the patience. Yeah. Like yeah. even Mrs. Black, you had to go explore other things and then come back to Mrs. Black and ask nicely. I, yeah, it just because I knew that it was something that was important and that, you know, it was, it was hard to do. I mean, because like I said, she's kind of a tough person. Um, one of the stories that sticks with me when I was like eight or nine years old, she had a little red book like this, and you had to put in how many minutes each day you practiced, and your mother had to initial it, had to initial. Wow. So she brought, she's, and that she always asked for it first. And the lessons were $5 a half an hour. So in this, for in this, you know, at this time, mm -hmm. that would be approximately 50 to $60 a half an hour for a lesson with her wow. in this time. That's a, she's a hundred dollars an hour to take a piano lesson with her now, for, you know, if she, it was happening now, just because of, you know, the, where the dollar is, but I had my $5 bill. I had my book. I gave her the book. She goes, what happened on Wednesday? It was blank. I didn't practice that day. And, and I said, she said, what happened? I said, I don't know. I just think I had homework or something. You know, I just didn't practice that day. I'm sorry. You know? And she said, do you have your money? And I went, uh-huh. So I gave her the money and she goes, I'll see you next week. I'll see you next week. I was like, no, no, no. You know, cause my mother's sitting outside in the car reading a book. And so I, I go outside, I get in the car and she goes, what happened? I said, I didn't practice. I was crying. I didn't practice on Wednesday. I didn't practice on Wednesday. And she goes, well, so what happened? I don't know. No, I can't take my lesson. And she said, and she goes, where's the money? And I said, she took it. And here's the change. Here's the change from when that happened. And now my mother sat there and looked at me and she said, we're not going to let that happen again, are we? And I went, no, no. So by golly, I practice 30 minutes every day. So that's such a life lesson though. And we have to teach those lessons. I'm so glad you said this whole practice thing, because we just talked about it in my methods class on Monday. Yes. How do you teach practicing? Yes. And it is an intro. You have to teach the students how to do it. Yes. And so many of the college students are still learning right themselves how to practice especially singers yes. instrumentalists yes. instrumentalists know okay i'm going to start with playing some scales i'm going to get warmed up i'm going to mm -hmm. okay where's my scale book i'm going to you know get the fingerings doing all that guess what mrs black did here we go getting the fingering mm -hmm. doing both hands you know octaves in the piano mm -hmm. okay now this major key this major key you know doing mm -hmm. all the scales and then sight reading and you know what she had me do crack open a hymnal now, i always told my kids yes. this Crack open a hymnal, set a metronome. If it's mm -hmm. too fast, slow it down and then get your foot off the pedal and play like an organist. Yeah. Play like an organist. Boom, boom. Because you have to go, guk, guk. there's no time. You can't fudge, you know? Nope. And so, uh, and if you can't do all four hands or four hands, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Can't do both hands, <laughs> then you know, do one, do one, you know, do the other. See, you know, you know, figure, you know, yeah. but you gotta do it every day, 
Yes, it's muscle memory every day. But you have to set a plan. You have to do it. You have to every day. And I love that Mrs. Black taught you that lesson. Mm -hmm. And that's such a hard thing to do as teachers, that fine line between nurturing and teaching the hard lessons. Yeah. And I, I'm thankful that, that she did this. She, she really set me on this path, especially when I crawled back, because the, giving me all that theory, think about it as a conductor now, hello, the theory is just like, I'm looking at chord structures. I'm looking at balancing chords. I'm looking at how, you know, what is the, the you know, the, 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 how, how the voices move, how they cross all of those things. What I love is that you've shared your story so vulnerably and in your notes preparing for this, you talked about the importance of vulnerability. Do you want to talk to that regard? Well, it's something that, you know, I mentioned Weston Noble at, at Luther College. He's a very special man, uh, a very religious man being at Luther, you know, um, and, um, you know, when we were singing in the choir, you know, yeah, we rehearsed every day for an hour in the afternoon. And, but rehearsal and, and particularly performance was kind of like worship in a way. Um, we always were, um, you know, critically listening to each other and connecting with each other and connecting with what we were singing about and the text. And a lot of the music was sacred music. A lot of it was sacred music. And, but we also sang secular music as well, but more, you know, like uh, Debussy and Ravel and the, those kinds of things. And, um, um, but he was just such a, a, a wonderful mentor. And, and he taught with this sense of vulnerability. You know, he always, you know, it wasn't unusual for him in performance to cry. It mm -hmm. wasn't unusual for him to just be kind of moved. And as a result, we all connected with him that way. You know, sometimes in performance, he would be conducting and then he would stop conducting. And we'd all be, you know, we'd be holding hands. You know, it's kind of a Luther you know, St. Olaf, you know, mm -hmm. Lutheran mafia thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we all kind of <laughs> both hands. And all of a sudden we'd be squeezing each other's hands going like, okay, he's just stopped conducting. So it was such a great lesson for us because all of a sudden we have to go, okay, we don't have a visual. We have to do these. Mm -hmm. So listening to each other and staying, you know, together and, you know, tracking but I love that vulnerability um, with Mr. Noble and was always, and he always called us by our, our town. I mean, I didn't, I lived in a farm, so I didn't really live in a town, but he knew I grew up near Davenport. So he never called me Edie. He always called me Davenport, you know? <laughs> and he also knew I knew theory. He knew oh. that because while I was at Luther, I took the two years of theory that everybody takes, you know, the analysis and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But then I did two years of independent study in theory with the theory teacher and my senior paper was an analysis paper you know and so he knew that theory was my thing so he'd always you know be like steve he would go steve so this text you know what do you think it's about oh it's about nature and and that kind of thing you know it's just it's just painting a great picture edie what's the chord structure in measure 37 and then i'd be looking at it going like yeah <laughs> I can't, I can't analyze on, on cue. Well, I also had really strong relative pitch. So he would stop and he'd go, Edie, where are we in terms of intonation in the choir? And I would go, well, we're a little sharp. He goes, where did it happen? And what voice part did it? So Very talk, cool. talk about training my ears for the choir, you know, to yeah. be able to go, you know, wait a minute, you know, so that as a singer in the choir, I was constantly listening to the whole group of what was going on. And I think that helped me tremendously. Mm -hmm. So I think this vulnerability that Weston did, and then later in life, you know, like he did a presentation with Jeffrey Bores at the 2011 ACDA National Conference, which was in Chicago. I was just about Chicago. to say in Chicago. Yeah, in Chicago. And he did a session with Jeffrey Bores on, uh, on, on neurons, you know, and how the neurons fire in our brain. And, and, and Sharon Paul has a great new book about, you know, brain, um, how the brain functions best and how to teach uh, better to engage the brain the way, you know, how kids learn the best, which mm -hmm. is, it's a great book. And uh, Sharon Paul, get her book. And um, yeah, it's a great book. And, um, 
but he was talking about this with Jeffrey and how music fires these neurons and parts of our brain that doesn't go anywhere else. And then the thing that he was, the big point that that was what Jeffrey was talking about, but the big point that Weston was talking about was, okay, combine this, what music does to our brains and then connect it with the vulnerability that, you know, the students know that you're there. The students know that they're being, that, you know, Brene Brown, you know, being seen mm -hmm. and heard and mm -hmm. valued. And Weston was talking about this, you know, like, you know, a decade plus ago, you know, with quite a lot of detail, because that's who he was. And um, the other thing that the other thing that I loved about Mr. Noble is that he would, and I, I've always carried that into my teaching is if, if something went wrong, or if he made a mistake or something, he would always stop and just say, oh, let's do that again, you know, and I, that didn't go very well, let's try it again. And I found that one of my favorite instructions to the choir is, well, there's two of them. One is to stop and go, oh, I'm sorry, I can do that better. Uh, please do that again for me so that I can get better at this. Please do that, for, you know, help me get better. And then the kids know that we're doing this together as a team, that it's not top down. And then the, the other thing is, another instruction is to actually say, oh, I just tried something there and I don't, it, and it didn't work. Um, uh, so, you know, um, let, me, let me try that again. So, so that the kids know I did some kind of conducting thing that they didn't respond to. So then they all look up on their music, like, what did she do? You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. They suddenly look up. They, yeah, they're looking up and really in, in doing that engaging. The other thing that I learned from Mr. Noble, which was also this vulnerability thing, is to do what I just said a minute ago, the questioning, to actually, you know, like, you know, like connect with a student, call them by name or their town and actually, you know, uh, have asked them questions and gear it to a question that you know that they can be successful. Even if Weston asked a true false question, you know, da, 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 true or false. And then a kid would go, and then Weston would go, <laughs> false. And he goes, that's all right. That's all right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> he would, you know, see them starting to form the word and they go, wait, you know, <laughs> so that they could be successful. And yeah, I think right. that I, everybody has those stories. And it's not just Weston. I mean, we've all had these mentors that, you know, have been successful in connecting with the students on a level. And, and you know, I have to say, my teaching has morphed so much in these 47 years of teaching. Um, that you know, when I first started, I had to be such a disciplinarian, do you know what I mean? Because I was teaching middle school and junior high and, and with 70 kids in a choir, 70 mm -hmm. kids in seventh grade choir. I mean, what? I mean, that's kind of crazy, but um, I had to have really strong rules that I would follow. Mm -hmm. It wasn't popular all the time. And, and then I got to college and it's so different because they're there because they want to be there. So if somebody's doing something they don't, they shouldn't be doing. You can literally look at a college kids and go, <laughs> go, really? Mm. Really? Are we doing that? Really? And then they go, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, they're just, you know, we'll back away. It's not a, a big issue, but I think it's a big issue for people that, that, that um, trying to establish this wonderful connection with your students, but at the same time, not, you know, to have these things in place so that you can be productive and that they're not going all over the place. I think every teacher, when they start, myself included, wanted every kid to like them. It's never going to happen. Know, you know, and, and it's not going to happen. It's just not. And so I've learned that over the course of the years, like even at, I'll, I'll give you an example at, at, in terms of this connection with students, this vulnerability it used to be like, it's in the syllabus. If you can't be at the rehearsal, maybe you have this in your syllabus. If you can't be there, send me an email, send me a text, call me, whatever. Let me know you're not going to be there, right? And before COVID hit, if somebody wasn't there and nobody knew where they were, I didn't know, didn't hear from them. I would, after rehearsal, you know, like call or text them or email and say, hey, you weren't in rehearsal today. Um, we missed you, but where were you? 
you know, mm -hmm. where were you? And then it'd send this out, you know, and then maybe I'd hear from them, maybe I wouldn't. When COVID hit, if somebody didn't show up for a rehearsal, the first email that went out was, are you okay? Mm -hmm. And that's a real different kind of thing. Where were you? And now, are you okay? And I realized that I should have been, are you okay? The whole time. Mm. That's what it should be, is mm. are you okay? And I think that's one of the things that the pandemic has taught us, you know, that we've learned so much um, uh, new things, new skills, uh, new ways of doing things. Um, yeah, it's, it's really changed how we do things. I mean, look at us. We're doing a Zoom. We're doing a Zoom meeting today. We're doing a I mean, Zoom meeting. Before, before COVID, someone would have said Zoom and I would have gone, huh? You know? <laughs> we used to know. meet as the Advocacy and Collaboration Committee on Zoom. And I remember trying to explain to everyone what Zoom was prior to. We've been doing this since 2017, 2018. Uh -huh. But I needed, I'm a, I need faces to, to make contact. I'm so extroverted. Right. The phone doesn't cut it. Cut it. So right. we were Zooming beforehand. So, I mean, now that it's common language it's so cool but i going back to that vulnerability thing it's really what you're telling us is vulnerability with boundaries and vulnerability with understanding that there are times that those boundaries need to be flexed a little bit oh and my goodness learn so much through that absolutely i mean and that's another thing with this pandemic with with i don't know what you but about your students but um my last you know last year teaching i mean i was going to retire in 2020 right at the beginning of the pandemic, that's when it's going to retire. And I came back for another year because the search failed. So they said, why don't you come back? And all these things that you wanted to do in 2020, the symphony, the tour to Hong Kong and South Korea, mm -hmm. your, your swan, you know, international trip, your alumni choir and dinner mm -hmm. and concert, all that'll happen if you come back. And I was like, okay, well, none of that happened. None of that happened. You know, <laughs> none, none of that happened, you know, but I think that this, this has taught us that this that this vulnerability is really important and I, all these kids were, have really struggled with depression mm -hmm. this separation from their colleagues and mm -hmm. and I, I i was fortunate my last year we got the choir could meet in the auditorium really spaced out with masks and everything and i remember i went up to one of the students in the choir a uh, 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 soprano and and i said so how you doing any anyway it was like a couple weeks into school i said how you doing she goes, well, it's really hard. It's really hard. And I said, yeah, I know. I know it is. And she said, this is my only class where I meet, see people. I'm on, all my classes are on Zoom. Mm -hmm. All my classes are on Zoom are virtual, except this one. This is the only place where I get to see my friends. Mm -hmm. And, and I thought to myself, I mean, that's just, it's just so hard. Mm -hmm. And so, and there were also, I had like last year, I had, I had like two or three, three students in the choir who were going through, you know, like transgender um, issues and, and being able to really, you know, support them and talk with them. I mean, after teaching for so many years, you know, I'm changing my language, you know, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, you can't say, hey, guys, let's start at B, you know, and I caught myself early on in that year, you know, um, just you know, with this new awareness going like, okay, guys, let's start at B. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Tenors and basses. Let's start at B. Mm -hmm. And then one of my, one of my tenors sent me a text or a email after, and he goes, I just want you to know, we really appreciate you. You're trying. Oh, I really appreciate yeah. that you're trying, you know? And I said, well, I'm going to get better. I promise I'll get better. And I think that's what it's all about as teachers and, and as musicians and mentors, mentors, mm -hmm. to be that role model for kids to see that, you know, that, that you, and are we successful all the time? No, no, we're not. But also to wrap our head around that, that right. we're not, we're not going to be successful with every kid, but what we should sure try. But yeah, you never know when something's going to make an impact. I mean, Yes. I wonder if your high school teacher that just happened to walk outside and invite you to sing in that little quartet knew what a change that made in your life. Mm -hmm. I wonder mm -hmm. if the people that adjudicated your audition into Allstate as a sophomore knew mm -hmm. what an impact that made. And you know, that mentorship piece is such a perfect segue into this final element we want to talk about today. And that's giving back through service to the profession. Absolutely. 
well, I'm, you know, I, I kind of kick myself and, you know, I was this, what do you call it? A student chapter advisor at, mm-hmm. at NAU when I was, you know, like a, the assistant director of choral studies initially, and then going into director of choral studies for a while. And I just thought that it was really important that every choral ed major is a member of ACDA. You know, you just have to be a member. You just got to do this because I didn't have that when I was a kid. Weston Noble was a founding member of ACDA. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know anything about ACDA, nothing, when I was in college. And then I got out and I was involved in the Iowa Music Educators and going to their conference and everything. And then my third year teaching, someone went up and said, are you going to go to the ACDA National Convention in Dallas? And I went, "Um, uh, I I wasn't planning on it. No, I don't. I'm not not even. And they said, yeah, there's a national convention in Dallas. And I went, "Okay, okay. So that spring of 1977, I went to the national conference in Dallas wow. and it was life changing to hear mm-hmm. Frank Pooler's choir from Long Beach and Elaine Brown's singing city choir from Philadelphia and, and Howard Swan spoke and um, William Schumann spoke as a, gave a keynote and, you know, composers and just, I mean, it was just going to sessions and going to performances and it was just amazing. Mm -hmm. And then I think it was in 70, maybe not 77, but 78, I started going to the Iowa summer ACDA Mm -hmm. conferences where I got to meet all these other teachers from Iowa and, and they'd always bring in guests, you know, like Albert McNeil singers or Chanticleer or, or, you know, in residence, Jester Harrison, you know, for residencies and you got to meet these people and have lunch with them. And wow. it just was became this great knit thing. But did I do anything? Did I volunteer to do anything in Iowa? No, I didn't. I didn't. I was just going to things and being excited about being there. Then really? I got to then I got to NAU. Okay. And that was in 1990. So I had been teaching 16. I've been out of, you know, 16 some years or so. Yeah right? Yeah, 16 years. And then I get there and Mike Scheibe goes, you want to be the newsletter editor for the Western region? And I was like, uh, and he goes, hey, come on, tenure track, tenure track, you need to tenure track. And I said, okay, all right. So I did that. And then I was the R&R chair for, you know, student activities for Arizona. Then I was the college one. Then I was a state president. Then I was a region president you know, and, and then I've been helping with interest sessions at three national conferences. Hey, it's Emmy. So sorry to interrupt. We had a little glitch in our recording system. And as Dr. Copley was telling the story about how she got involved with ACDA, there was a silence, a really long silence. So I want to fill in the gaps. Fast forward, she talked about how much ACDA had impacted her and how she had served in a variety of other roles at the state, regional, and national level, including going through all the wonderful interest sessions that come through at multiple national conferences. And then she got the call, and that's where our recording kind of went paused. She got the call where she was asked if she would be okay with a nomination for president, and she said no. So in these next few minutes, you'll hear her tell the story of saying no and how that no turned into a yes. And I went, no, there's no way. Not while I'm teaching and doing my community choir and guest conducting. No, I can't do it. And then I just ended up um, saying, no, I can't do it. Then they asked me again. I went, no, can't do it. Then I retired. I knew I was retiring. And Tom Shelton called me and said, you're retiring. What else you got to do? Come on, come on. And I said, what did you've done it? You're a past president. Looking back, why was it so important for you to do this? And he said, because it was really incredible. All the people I got to meet and the, and I feel like, you know, working together with all these people, we're making a difference. And so I went, okay, and decided to run. So I'm in my first year of that eight year commitment. And yeah, and, um, but um, as a matter of fact, I have a constitution and bylaws meeting tonight, you know, cause I'm the chair of that. I'm, I feel like ACDA has blessed my life 
and that that I have been able to meet fantastic people, just like Tom said, I've been able to meet so many people around the country. I've been so blessed to be able to do all these all states and to go and do summer ACDA conferences at different you know states. And so all of this is great, just building community and doing all of this. And I didn't say this, but you know, 40 years after I sang in the all state choir, I conducted the all state choir. <sighs> in Iowa. So 40 years later, I was guest conducting it. And I just conducted it again last November for their 75th anniversary. So I've conducted the Iowa Allstate twice. So, and when I do that, you know, those kids hear this story Mm -hmm. that this is the Iowa Allstate set the path, you know, Mm -hmm. for in, for choral music for my life. And I'm so blessed to you know, like do a session somewhere and have someone come up to me and say, you did my all, I mean, like, um, you did my all state in 2000, whatever, four, you know, and I'm a choral director now because of that, you know, so so many kids have come up and said this and I'm going like, well, that's fantastic. Do you like what you're doing? And they're like, yes, I really am. And so, and, and some of these people are like, finalists for like the Grammy award-winning music teacher in the country, you know, and I'm like, it's just, that's, this is the reward to see the students that I've had the wonderful opportunity to work with and to see them be successful and to see them uh, loving what they do. And also, you know, just, you know, it's just, yeah, it's passing on, effect. passing yes. on this love of music and love for one another that this art form does. I was playing golf Tuesday, having lunch with my friends in golf. And one of my friends turned to me and said, I used to sing all the time, but I don't sing anymore. And I said, why not? And they, and they, well, you know, I'm older now I'm older. And I, I said, yeah, but they, if we have a community choir here, you should sing in the community choir. You should sing. And yeah, yeah, I suppose I should, you know, I really should. And, and I said, you know, it'd be good for you. You know, the breathing, you know, just breathing and meeting people. And, and also it's the one thing that it's great for your brain and it's great for your body and it's great for your soul, you know, and what else are you doing that? I mean, I know if you got a hole in one, it would be great for your soul, but I mean, it's different because yeah. because and this is i think one of the main reasons why i went into choral music was that goosebump moment in allstate mm-hmm. the visceral power of music that it it's like no other art form i mean like yes anything that has to do with 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 the singing voice and and just me i should make broaden it out music because i can listen to a i can listen to a uh a drum and bugle core and get and get goosebumps for eight minutes listening to a drum and bugle core. You know yes. what I mean? It's just you know, just when they turn around and play, you know, just like, whoa, you know, and but you know, I know it's it's that music, music does this somehow. I don't know what it does it, but it hits something that sends it through your whole body. Mm-hmm. And and I love art, I love going to galleries and I love theater. You know, I, I love that, the emotional quality, but it doesn't make your body go, yeah. And that's what I like about it. <laughs> I love it. If you're watching this episode, I highly recommend, uh, if you're listening, I highly recommend jumping over to YouTube so you can see Dr. Copley's amazing <laughs> visuals that go with this conversation. <laughs> So hey, this has been so much fun. I really appreciate Thanks. you sharing your story. Before we go, I always let the guest share one thing that really matters, the one thing you don't want them to forget. Mm. Mm. Love what you do and love the people you have the wonderful opportunity to be with. Mm. Can't go wrong. And one more thing, just an add-on. Wake up every day and do the best you can. Yeah. Oh, I love that. So good. Because nobody can, nobody can ask for more. Just do the best you can each day. I love it. Hey, this has been so great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Emily. Thank you. All right. So my favorite part, everything that Dr. Copley talked about in her story, she would say, it was so hard, but it was so good. 
And I want you to remember that whatever you're doing, whether it's hard or easy or fun or challenging, whatever, you can choose to find that positive. And if you're struggling, reach out for help. You are not in this alone. As Dr. Copley talked about in the end, it's the community. It's the the things we're able to do together. She quoted Tom Shelton and said, it's working together with all the people to make such a big difference. You're not in this by yourself. But this thing we get to call a job is just the coolest. I want to know what you thought emilybirch.org slash contact jump over to patreon.com slash music it matters like and review all the things but really above all you my friend you matter we all know that music matters especially the stories that we're creating every single day in this life that we get to live and i'll see you next time on the music it matters podcast